Okay. Um, so, the factor mobility factors here are uh, labor force, labor force, capital, and uh, other production factors, supplies, semi manufactured goods, and so on. Uh, is an is an explanatory factor for explaining changes in capital and labor endowment. Endowment means the resources that I have at hand. So the ability to move is important for where the different resources end up in a general equilibrium perspective, right? As we have seen. Increased capital stock <coughs> increases possibilities to invest. Uh, and the capital stock increases because expected returns may be higher than in other regions, because of demand effects, because of cost effects. And the workforce moves to where the wages are highest in these, uh, in these models that we are addressing. Wage is a compound measure. Uh, <coughs> It's not only the paid wage, but it could be real estate prices. Could be diversity of employment possibilities. It's less risky for highly educated people to move to small places to or to larger places. It's less risky to move to larger places because there are more work to be found there. And also the supply of leisure and cultural activities could be an, a factor that affects this wage term, which is consists of actually a lot of factors. So we can condense this into a at least the the factor mobility and the production factors into a uh, an illustration like this. So the, the, the end here is the region's output growth. And from the lower end here and upwards, there, is some, there are some uh, causes and effects. So the rate of return in regions relative to rate of return in other regions of, of capital, the wage level, again, interpreted as, as a compound measure, and the growth of the region population of working age. Uh, that is an, a challenge for s some of the bigger economies, including the Chinese one, that there is a, a problem with the, with the aging population. But again, if <coughs> if the if the let's say the profile or the demographic profile is is favorable, that uh, affects of course the human capital in terms of let's say people in in the working age. The relative wage level affects the inflow of labor. This these two affects the growth of the labor force. It's affect the growth of the capital stock. And then you might have some savings that uh, also affects the growth of the capital stock. You have technical progress as one external factor into this model, which again then can, can be one, let's say, cause of event or, uh, causes and, uh, and uh, events, let's say, flows in a, in a, in a growth model. And we will expand this as we as we move along uh, in the course. But now I will turn to this uh, export-driven kinesium model as, as an early example of a cumulative model, a self-reinforcing growth model. And here the growth is demand-driven. 
So increase in demand is what, what is, is driving this model. Uh, so you can say that we, we, we talk about an export-driven model. It's the demand for exports that are the driving force here. And exports may not be just from one country to another, but it could also be an export from one region to another. So, uh, and the, the w what we, or what an economy or an economic system chooses to export depends, of, of course, upon their, let's say, comparative advantage. What is, what are they good at doing? Cheap labor specializes in labor-intensive industries, countries or regions with cheap labor. You have the example there, India and China. Natural resources gives export of raw material, in many cases like uh, Norway, who exports a lot of energy, oil and gas, some hydropower during, during uh, summertime, when Europe is in the need of air condition. Uh, regions with a good supply of capital, specializes in capital intensive goods. Silicon Valley with uh, information technology, Norway with other types of technologies as examples. So the export is the driven is the main main uh, driving factor here. So this this model is actually con it consists of four equations. I'll come to them. Uh, and as another driver in this model, which is kind of the driving force for the self-reinforcing mechanism here, is this Ferdorn coefficient, which actually increases productivity as the size of the economic activity grows. When the size of the economic activity grows, this coefficient is boosting productivity a bit further because of these scale effects mainly but the scale effects in in several dimensions human capital better use of production equipment and so on and there is not one <coughs> coefficient in terms of value the value of this uh, production or productivity coefficients coefficient will vary among regions, depending on their production structure, depending on their capacity, depending on their, let's say, the, the amount of human capital that, are, that is available, and so on. So first, <coughs> conceptually, this model is uh, working like this. We are still considered with the output growth, economic growth. Uh, we are looking at uh, the substitution between labor and capital, conceptually. We are looking upon uh, research and development, which is, uh, can say something about the rate of technology change but also something about change in human capital growth in the capital labor ratio meaning that if if you have a lot of capital behind each man year the productivity per man year will increase that is what is meant in this case by the growth of labor productivity behind, e li let's say, like, like in, in some Norwegian sectors, there is a lot of capital behind each, uh, e each man year, for instance, in the oil and gas sector. <coughs> then uh, <coughs> we have um, the rate of change in price of regional exports. That has to do with the underlying uh, 
let's say, growth in wages and the underlying change in productivity. And we'll see this uh, clearly uh, later on. But <coughs> the rate of change in the price of regional export as a result of productivity increase, inflation and the growth in wages wi will among uh, it will affect the growth of regional exports, but that is also affected by, let's say, prices on the competing goods in the global market, substitutes or complements in the global market, the goods that you compete with, will of course affect this, and the business cycles in your export markets will also, uh, of course, affect the growth in regional exports. But the growth in re regional exports is an indicator here of the size of the or the magnitude of the economic system, which then links back to the regional output growth. And now I'll show you how this works. It's uh, it's not very difficult. Four equations. Relationship between productivity growth and output. This is productivity growth. This is the productivity growth that we ha from the, let's say, you can collect data about that from the National Bureau of Statistics. How much have <coughs> has product, uh, productivity increased by per man year, for instance, in the region. The lambda is this Ferdorn coefficient, which has a number between 0 and 1, closer to 0 than closer to 1. So it's a, it says something about what is the increase in product productivity linked up with the output from this economic system last year? Minus one means this year minus one, last year. So if you have an input increase, and the, uh, this is an increase in percent, not an absolute number, but in percent, I'll show you a numerical example later on, uh, later on. So a positive number larger than one, no, sorry, larger than zero, multiplied by a certain percentage increase in economic output will increase the productivity. If the output goes down, which may take place from time to time due to business cycles, the productivity will be reduced. And we talk about productivity growth. Then, equation two. Equation two uses productivity growth as an input in the equation. So we are trying to explain price inflation and price of the exporting good we are talking about now is a function of the W, which is cost inflation. We can uh, interpret it that as the wage increase in percent per man year. And Q <coughs> is the growth in productivity. So if the, let's say the wage increase is uh, from uh, last year to this year is 1%, no, sorry, it say it is 3%, 3%, and the productivity growth is 2.5%. Then we have a price inflation of 0.5%. 0.5% 0 
if the production increase or sorry productivity increase balances the wage increase then the price inflation is zero and if the productivity increase outweighs the wage increase meaning that the productivity increase is stronger than the increase in wages then the price inflation is negative and that is a good thing because then prices go down and that is uh, that is what can happen as a result of such scale effects that I showed if the size of the economic system increases so then we have productivity and we have price then the third equation is the growth of exports x is the quantity the growth in the quantum of a given commodity that we export these are price elasticities b the b's here are the b0 and b1 are price elasticities so b1 is the direct price elasticity and b1 is the cross price elasticity i'll explain wha wha what i mean by that and uh, <coughs> the direct price elasticity is the change in quantity divided by quantity and again divided by the change in price divided by the price level that we s ha s that we use at the outset so this is equal to what we call e this is the change what this means is that it is change in quantity of output of a given good from a certain price change and that is what we call a price elasticity which can be let's say minus 0 0.9 and this means that a 10% increase in P gives a 9% reduction in quantity and those numbers vary between goods and we need empirical studies to determine the size of the price elasticity but we know quite a lot about price elasticities for, for, for various goods. But so this is just an example. If you, if you solve this, uh, and you can, if you, for instance, uh, take uh, a change If the quantity is, is 100 at the outset, and we don't know the, uh, the, the change, but we know that the price increases 10%, and we know that the elasticity is minus 0 0.9, you can solve this for uh, for uh, delta x y and you will get that a number equal to 9 as I have indicated here 
the cross price <coughs> LSTC is exactly the same with a small exception. We can study the price of the uh, or the quantity change in the exporting good, but we study as a consequence of a change in prices of another good. So quantity change in the exporting good divided by the price change of, let's say, a good that you compete with in the global market. And you get an elasticity. Let's say that it is positive 0 0.1. If it is positive, then we have a substitute, meaning that you compete. Because then we see that when price go up in the world market, the price of the exporting good goes up. So a 10% increase in world market prices means that we sell 1% more of our good. So when the price of a competing good increases, we increase our sales. But it could be min negative. And we call them that a complement. Complement. Let's say if, if we are um, a car manufacturer, we, we, we ma um, make and sell cars. And this is the oil price. So if the oil price increases, we can expect that the sale export of new cars decreases a bit. It's not that popular to buy a new car if the, if the oil price increases uh, sharply. So then we have a complement. Price increase, volume decrease. And again, that is an empirical question to determine the size of those cross price elasticities, but they are, some estimates are, are at hand. And then we have the B2, which is the income elasticity. Which is, which is also very interesting. And then we have the same relationship between the, the good, x, but then we talk about elasticity with respect to income. And now we are touching upon global business cycles. So if the, in, if the, and we can translate that as GDP growth. So if GDP in our market for the exporting good, if the GDP is growing, There are good reasons to expect that the demand for our exporting good will also increase. So let's say that uh, 
let's say it's one that elasticity, elasticity is positive with a value of 1.2, which means that a 10 percent increase in GDP in our markets out there, 10 percent increase will then increase the demand for our product with 12 percent. It's not uncommon that EI is larger than 1, but it's not always the case. It may, in some special cases, even be negative. It may be negative. It may be negative if you are in a situation where an increase in income will stop you from consuming the good or reduce your consumption of the good. And we call that inferior goods. Uh, I did a study of public transport some years back in a, in a local market and I found out that the public transport had a negative income and elasticity. And think about it. If the income, private disposable income grows, suddenly people buy car number two. And then demand for public transport will, will decrease. And uh, the, my study showed that that was actually happening. It was around, I think it was uh, 15 years ago or something, long while, long while since. But what we see here then is that a price change from equation number two, price increase with a negative uh, elasticity indicated by this minus will cause demand to go down. A price increase in the competing market with a positive elasticity will make the price, the, the quantity X go up. And if the income out there in our market increases, that will also contribute to an increase in output of the exporting good. So now we are, we are here dealing with prices on the commodity itself, on the competi competing commodities, and on the income in our exporting market. Set is the, let's say, the change in income in the exporting, the market wh where we export our products. And then the fourth is much simpler. It's the output growth in the economy as, a, as a, uh, expressed by the export growth, which is taken from equation three. And the output growth, then I'm talking about the growth in production, the activity level. And then we are back to the previous lecture last week on the input-output models. Because then we have the multiplier, C0, here, which says something about if the, export, the, the volume of exports increases, what will then be the result in terms of increase in production activity and in employment? In, in this uh, model, we are using the production value and not, not the employment as such. So if the multiplier is, if you remember the, the cases from, uh, from the airport industry, the multiplier was in the somewhere between 1.3 and 1.6. Then the, the percentage increase in, uh, in exports times the multiplier gives the percentage increase in output. And that output increase says something about the size of the economic activity, which is then again plugged into this one. And then we can run the same exercise again for, let's say, year two 
in the analy analytical period. I'll show you. We'll ten minutes. It's planned. One quick question. Yeah. Uh, about the equation number three. Yep. Uh, if you calculate the elasticity uh, and you get, for example, in the first one, the B zero, you get a negative value. Mm -hmm. No, just you should not use minus minus. Yeah. You should just use minus. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. And there has been some confusion about that, so thank you for asking. Yeah. But you'll just the minus b zero is kind of mm. the so sort of. You use the num you use you use the number yeah. and then the minus is yeah. kind of the the relationship between price changes and uh, and volume changes. Yeah. Uh, but uh, formally, and this is this is uh, cited from the article. But formally, you should have this uh, this absolute number yeah. notation, yeah. and then the and then the 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 sign in addition to that. I think I'll make that clear when you get some, uh, because we'll have an exercise on this. Because otherwise, it might be, uh, it might, the, the calculations might turn out to be not, not too correct. But let's start with this and say that, well, we can start with equation one. And we can say that uh, Q equal to A plus lambda times Y year minus 1 last year. And if we have from the National Bureau of Statistics, we have an increase in productivity independent of exports or the size of the economic system equal to plus 2%. Uh, from a statistical analysis of the link between output growth and productivity, we have identified this lambda, this per Dorn coefficient to be 0.4. I will spend quite a lot of time on this this productivity growth issue later on, but uh, this is based on Ferdorn's work from 1949, actually, where he, where he studied the link between output growth and and productivity growth. And 0.4 is is fairly in the middle of his uh, his uh, his interval for that coefficient. And the output growth last year was one uh, percent. Not too high increase in output. So if we plug in these numbers, two, zero point four, one, we get Q equal to 2.4 percent. So this is the productivity increase based on this information. Then number two, P is equal to wage increase minus productivity increase. And if we say that uh, it was a good year for the negotiators, so the wage growth was 3%. Productivity growth was uh, 2.4, which gives P equal to uh, here plus 0.6. So we have a slight 
price inflation. Because the wage, the negotiated wages, is slightly higher than the productivity growth. Then the question three, which is then output as a function of of uh, prices times uh, price elasticity in the home market, cross price elasticity times uh, price change in the foreign market, and the change in income in the foreign market. So I can use the same numbers as I used uh, here. It's zero minus the elasticity is minus 0 0.9. Uh, the price change is 0 0.6. The cross price elasticity, 0 0.1. And the price change can be set to, uh, let's see, 2% uh, price change in the foreign market. So they do even worse when it comes to inflation which is a good thing for us as exporters. P2 is uh, the income elasticity, 1.2. And the growth in, uh, in, in, uh, in uh, foreign GDP or revenues, income, is 2%. And if you just use this information, you get an increase in x of 2.06. So what we see here is that the price change in the foreign market gives a resulting change in x partially, the partial effect will be 0.2%. The partial effect of the income change in the foreign market is 2.4%. And the partial effect of the price change will be some somewhere in the area of minus 0.54 so we see here that the global market is helping us out of this uh, decline in export as a partial result of the price inflation. And then you can play around and, and see, start to gather information about this. Because this is what you do when you are going to do market analysis if you are uh, employed at an uh, exporter of salmon or oil or whatever, you are addressing GDP growth, elasticities, price changes in the foreign market, and the, of course the domestic situation, which is here. And try to work out how will this affect our exports. And then four, which is y equal to C0 times x, and the x is 2.06%, and then we have the multiplier. And you can say that based on an input-output study, the relationship between export growth and activity is 1.5, and then you get y equal to point one percent as an output increase as a result of this. So this is 
the output change this year caused by a chain of events. And indeed, you have quite a lot of information. And now you can, you can run the same exercise again, start, and make forecasts for year two based on what happened this year. I will not go through that because we are running out of time, but it's, it's easy now because go back to one again. Q, we keep the same underlying productivity growth, 2% plus the same co for darn coefficient. Not, no reasons to expect any big changes from this year to next. But y minus 1 is not, it's not 1%, but it's 3.1. Then you get Three point twenty five increase percent increase in productivity. And then two. The price inflation. Now if you assume that well it's still three percent wage increase. But the productivity has increased with three point twenty five meaning that you have a negative pri price inflation of minus 0 0.25. And then you can plug that into this one. But perhaps these factors, the elasticities are not bound to change much in, in the short run, but perhaps you get a, a different scenario here or a different scenario here lower income growth abroad, maybe the lower income growth means that the price inflation will go down, so you might get less, let's say, a smaller pull effect from the global market, which s gives them still the lucky result then, that y you are managing well in your own house, so to speak, domestically, by having the price growth under control. So you don't need that much help from the global market to still grow. But you see that what is happening abroad will affect this. Eventually, it will affect this. And then you can make forecasts for year three based on new information about this. But you see that if nothing changes here in terms of uh, growth abroad, price change abroad, elasticities, this will cause a stronger output growth next year if everything develops as it did this year. Okay, then, so then you will have a self reinforcing growth based on the link between output growth and productivity growth here, this coefficient. But changes may occur because of the situation in the global markets. So this model is simple and very nice for explaining the importance of having control over your own prices, but also to keep a keen eye on what is going on in your export markets when you are engaged in, uh, in exporting in industries. So I think I'll just stop <coughs> with this. And um, next time, next week, we will have group work. We will gather here at the start of the session uh, you will get the you will get exercises and i will list some rooms i have allocated uh, a lot of rooms and some of you can sit here as well and i will be present to to guide you uh, next week then okay 
thank you